We are here to have the RDA uh, meeting for today. Uh, I welcome everybody here and everybody online to the Redevelopment Agency Board meeting. Our meetings are public and you're welcome to join us uh, in person on Zoom or by watching the City Council webpage, Facebook, YouTube, or Salt Lake City TV. Uh, we hope you will continue to join us uh, however manner you feel comfortable with. Uh, we begin with comments to the board. I would like to remind everybody uh, that written comments might be submitted to the RDA offices via mail to P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84114, uh, 5476, or by emailing us at council dot comments at slcgov.com or by calling our 24-hour line 801-535-7654. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, before uh, we start, I want to remind everybody about the rules of the quorum, uh, which are in place to ensure that every meeting moves along well, uh, that we respect everybody and we make sure that everybody feels comfortable sharing their comments. A copy of the full rules of the quorums are available outside the door uh, and our staff will post it on the Zoom link. Uh, as soon as you might, uh, as, as some, as some of you might have noticed, we have switched from WebEx to Zoom uh, and that comes with some challenges and, and uh, learning curve. Uh, if you would like to comment on a public hearing today. We are accepting comments uh, in person and online on Zoom. Isaac Canedo from our staff will moderate our Zoom line and will message you with any questions, uh, message him with any questions about your registration. Uh, staff is handling a lot of tasks at the same time, so please minimize uh, your, your interaction with the staff only to ask them about technical issues or about minimal information updates. Uh, if you do need to talk, if you do need to talk to our staff, please se select Isaac Canedo uh, from the list of participants. Um, you can also raise your hand in Zoom, and uh, you will be contacted by the host. Taylor Hill and our staff will be calling calling those uh, who wish to comment based on the order of the names as we receive them. Um, if you are on Zoom, please unmute your mic when Taylor calls your name. Uh, you will need. Uh, we will now begin uh, our general comment period. Taylor, please start with our first comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like there is no one registered for general comments. Okay. I, uh, that is, uh, we basically are moving along very fast on the agenda. Uh, there is no public hearing uh, on item number B, and then item number C, uh, we'll, there's, uh, we're not going to receive some uh, business from the first item. Oh, we actually have them now. oh great. Um, so you can go to that item if you're comfortable. Yes. So we can go to item no number one. We, you know, we were get, f finishing some some uh, things on the agenda. Now we're going to uh, the election of the vice chair for the RDA, um, and uh, we need a motion. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair. Yes. I move that we elect. Board member Dan Dugan to serve as the vice chair for the remainder of the calendar year. Second. I have a motion by uh, board member Mano and a second by board member uh, Valdemoros to uh, select vice chair uh, to select the the, uh, the vacancy uh, of the vice chair for uh, the remainder of the year and uh, select Dan Dugan. Um, I, is there any discussion on this? Board member. Thank you very much for the motion. Thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to serve as the vice chair. I appreciate that very much, and I appreciate the uh, council's uh, uh, res you know, respect for my position here, and, I, and I, I look forward to working with you as on the board. Thank you. The election hasn't happened yet. Um, so let me, let, me, let, me, let me call the question. Uh, uh, is there any other comments? Okay, let me call the question, Council Member, uh, Board Member Mano. Do we? Oh. Paper ballot, paper ballots. On paper. Yeah. Oh, okay. No. So, we can so hold. Yeah, so you, were you going to vote on calling the question? Or I was going to call the question. No. Let's just vote on the paper. Can we, no, it's can that we, we avoid wanna, the paper? Sorry. I am a little crazy close, today. Motion to close nominations and then vote. 
Isn't that what we normally do? Let's do it. Okay, that's my move to close nominations and um, proceed to a vote by paper ballot. Second, if you needed a second. I think okay. you have to call the vote. Call the vote then. That's what I needed to do. That's, thank you so much for the rule. So, uh, I, uh, so Council Member Mano. Yes. Wharton. Yes. Uh, Dugan. Yes. Uh, Valdemoros. Yes. And I'm a yes. So we are voting now. Sorry for that. That was a mess. I wouldn't have known either how to do it. I did. I did give it to you. I did vote. Do you need our name on this? No. Well, the one that doesn't have a name. Well. Well, how do I know? Yes. We are not allowed to run any other elections beyond the internal ones. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> yes, the county, the county, and uh, our recorder. Thanks, everyone. So I have one vote affirming council member or board member Dan Dugan. Second ballot also affirms board member Dan Dugan as vice chair. Third affirms board member Dan Dugan. Fourth affirming Dan Dugan as vice chair. And the fifth affirms Dan Dugan as vice chair, so it's unanimous. So no need for names, so congratulations, board member Dugan. Um, is there any, I think that's it. So um, we're moving along on the agenda, item number two, the resolution RDA budget amendment number three for fiscal year 2022-2023. Um, ben Lutke from the council, the council Office Policy Analyst at the table, Danny Waltz coming in at the table to RDA Director, uh, May Beth maybe joining us, May Beth Thompson uh, joining us online, maybe a Chief Financial Officer. Your time. Thanks, Mr. Chair. This is a follow-up briefing from the board's meeting last week. You held the public hearing and closed it and then adopted one urgent item. It was $4 million for the Westside Community Initiative going to the Program Income Fund for a property purchase in the Nine Line project area. There is a corresponding item that the council is considering tonight in budget amendment number six on the general fund side to send the $4 million to the RDA. So that item needs to be approved in addition to the board's action last week in order for the property acquisition to proceed. The administration has requested that the board consider approving the remaining items in RDA budget amendment number three today. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, now would be the time to raise them. Members, any questions? There is a motion sheet in the packet. Uh, it says, uh, I move that the board approve all remaining items as proposed by the administration. I need Mr. a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the board approve all remaining items as proposed by the administration. Second. I have a motion by board member Mano and a second by uh, board member Dugan. Uh, any discussion on this? Okay. I will call the question. Board member Dugan? Yes. Board member Mano? Yes. Board member Baldemoros? Yes. Board member Wharton? Yes. And I'm a yes, that is uh, five and two absent. And that uh, motion carries. Um, we are moving along on the agenda. The, we're going to item number three, uh, the overview uh, of the redevelopment agency budget for fiscal year 2023-2024. Uh, on the table, uh, we added Jennifer Bruno, the Deputy Director of the Salt Lake City Council. Your time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll turn most of the time over to Danny, but just to orient um, the board, the RDA is essentially a department of the city, and so this is the RDA is essentially department budget briefings, the same way you've been receiving all the other department budget briefings as part of the mayor's proposed fiscal year 24 budget, but because it's obviously it's a separate um, agency, you hear it in your context as the board of the RDA. 
Um, to the extent that there are any follow-up questions needed or um, if there are any funding changes that the board members would like to make, we can schedule additional briefings and convene briefly as the board each time um, you would like those additional briefings. There have been a number of items that council members have raised in terms of general budget discussions that would fit within the context of the RDA so we can stay in touch with um, the RDA staff as those discussions evolve. But with that, I'll turn it over to Danny. Great. Thank you, Jen. Um, can we have our presentation pulled up, please? Awesome. Um, as Jen said, we are keeping with the overall theme and structure of the city budget and presentation. Ours will look a little bit different as we're not part of the general fund, so we have a little bit more details or uh, information we provide. And then also you'll see a few changes in terms of our structure as we are working towards the transition towards workday. So next slide, please. And then one more after that. Great. Um, the RDA budget is made up of multiple funds. You'll see that the majority of our funds are project area funds with the funding source being tax increment. We also have our four housing funds that are comprised of income from tax increment, the inland port money, and then also a contribution from the city's funding our future. And then we have our multi-use funds, which are within our program income fund and also include the revolving loan fund. This is where we realize other income from like parking structures, rents, uh, things like that. And then we have our own agency operations account. Um, one of the major differences we have from the general fund uh, is that we have several holding accounts that carry over year to year. These are defined as capital projects, and this is to provide for, for projects that either require multiple years of funding to accumulate funds to do something, or something that we just have carry over year to year as far as programs. Next slide, please. Our budget process is fairly simple. Uh, obviously, we project the revenue that we receive and then subtract our expenses and obligations as per our contracts and then allocate the remaining discretionary expenses to our programs and projects. Under revenue, you see that not only are we talking about tax increment, but the repayment of our loans and the rent payments that we realize. Uh, and then we have significant transfers both internally within our own funds and also external receiving that from the city or other sources. And then our expenses range from uh, tax increment reimbursements to developers and payments that we make to taxing entities, our statutory housing obligations, as well as debt service and other contractual obligations. Next slide, please. So we'll take a look at each of these in a little bit more detail, the first being revenue. Next slide one more time. Um, this is the revenue sources that we have looking at our project areas and our multi-use funds. You'll see that we have just over 47 million in projected revenue. This does not include our internal transfers, our cash balances, or our housing funds. Obviously, you see our largest source of revenue is our tax increment, and then we have approximately nine and a half million just in internal transfers between our funds. New to our budget process this year is what uh, Ben indicated with Budget Amendment 3 is that we have the allocation of just over 4.6 million in what are called the transition holding accounts. This is the additional tax increment that we just realized in our current fiscal year, uh, and we're carrying that over into next year's budget so that it can be appropriated and discussed by you as a board collectively. So that's new to this budget year. Uh, next slide, please. This is how the 45 plus million in tax increment looks across the various project area funds. Uh, there's a lot of numbers on this spreadsheet. Uh, you'll be tested at the end of it, so I hope you get a quick glimpse of them and can recite them. But really what this shows is the three columns on the left are what the actual tax increment has been within all the project area funds. 2023B is what was budgeted in this current fiscal year, and then 2023A is what you just approved as part of Budget Amendment 3 in terms of realizing the actual tax increment. 2024B is what we are projecting and budgeting in the next fiscal year. And then you'll see in the last column, it's the relationship between next year's budget versus the actuals we just received in 2023. Two things to note, number one, you'll see that the Central Business District and Block 70 are on a downward trend. And so we continue to show that within our projections. Uh, based on the research we're doing, uh, this looks like it's still the coming out of COVID impact for some of the CBD project area and mostly the hotel industry. The rest of the project area funds are being projected at a 2% increase over what we actually received. So that's a little bit less conservative than what we've done in years prior, but we're taking what the actual amounts were and then conservatively increasing that by 
Any questions on this? I forgot to mention that. If you have any questions, feel free to jump in and yell or throw something at me. I have a question. It might be more generic, but um, I tax increment is property tax increment, if I'm understanding it correctly. So um, why does pandemic uh, have an effect on property tax receipts? Is it because some businesses just choose not to pay their property taxes for the year, or is it that the valuation, okay. <laughs> the tax assessor has reduced the valuation based on not being able to receive the, income? Yes, it's a combination of factors. Jen's going to jump in if she... If I get anything wrong, number one, but also she always has way more information on this, so I appreciate her adding her background. Um, as a property tax basis, you have two things. Either the county can reassess based on what is happening just countywide and with property values generally, or the individual property owners can also appeal and ask for their property taxes to be reduced. So it's important to keep in mind that the money we just received in March and December from the county was what were the property taxes paid in November of 2022. And those payments and values are actually what's reflected in the assessed value as of January 2022-ish. And so if you're a property owner or a hotel or someone and you got your taxes for 2021 and you're in the middle of COVID, you're probably still seeing a lot of reassessments and appeals from those values as the market was hitting. That carried into tax year 2022, and then that's now the money we're receiving and budgeting for in 2023. So that's the relation. And mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, and the process um, is different for commercial property for them to appeal, and it's directly related to income. And so the way the assessor assesses commercial property is an income-based approach, which, you know, if you're a property owner and you have 50% office vacancy, you can show the a county very quickly that your income is reduced, therefore your assessment should be reduced, whereas a, a residential property owner would have to do, you know, market sales and comparables to argue with the county that their assessment should be reduced. So there's a direct... Um, sort of occupancy rate connection to the assessed value of businesses that were struggling in the pandemic. That is a very clear answer. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Uh, thank you. Next slide, please. This is just a visual representation of how that tax increment looks across the various project areas. Obviously, CBD is our largest generator of tax increment. Uh, but this is also to note that as you look at the depot district and granary, both those project areas are in their final couple years before they sunset, um, but you see that State Street and Nine Line, the newer project areas, are coming online uh, at the same value and will replenish that. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, our first two HTRZ applications are intended to kind of re-up both the Granary and Depot District areas in general, so you'll see those uh, hopefully come online as HTRZ project areas. Next slide, please. This slide deals with the revenue as it relates to our housing funds. Um, you'll see that we have just over 9.7 million in revenue across all of the housing funds. Uh, the internal transfers at the top are essentially the tax increment being transferred into from the various project area funds. That's the statutory requirement. The 1.4 million is an increase of what we are now receiving and a projection of what we'll receive from the inland port. Uh, and then the 1.7 million, the mayor's request for additional affordable housing, this is the amount over and above uh, the debt service as part of the North Temple Viaduct project area. So after transferring the money necessary to make that payment, uh, the mayor is recommending that the additional increase uh, go towards affordable housing. Uh, this decision, uh, as Jen mentioned in her memo, was made at about the same time that you as a board were indicating that you would like to see that potentially go to the North Temple project area for use. And so that's a decision point that, that you can make either as it relates to this specific funding request in this year's budget or uh, give us that direction for budgets moving forward. Next slide, please. Here's how that revenue looks across the four housing funds. You see the bulk of it is going into the housing development loan fund, which will be put out in ANOFA. Um, and then you'll see the increase in the West Side Community Initiative of the 1.4 million projected for next year, and then just a little over 400,000 in the transition account carrying over. Next slide, please. And next slide, moving from our revenue into our obligated expenses. Uh, you see that we have over 44 million in total obligations. The biggest of these is our reimbursement payments either to developers for tax increment or our payments directly to the taxing entities of what we kind of capture from our project areas and then pass along to them as part of our agreements. Uh, we also have a significant amount in debt service, both for Eccles and then the debt service on the North Temple Viaduct payment to Salt Lake City. And then from there we get into our property management 
and our obligations as they relate to both Gallivan and Eccles, uh, and then some minor obligations as they relate to infrastructure and contracts for commercial relocation. At the bottom are the obligations as they relate to internal transfers, again, debt service, administration, and then our housing requirements. Would it be possible, uh, Mr. Chair, sorry, uh, and this could be offline if that's easier, but um, the TI reimbursement taxing entity payments, could is it possible to break those out mm -hmm. between, because they seem like kind of pretty different things. It'd be great to see how much. Yeah. If you look at the um, key changes here? pages, starting on page 83, that will actually go through and even give you detail on which um, tax increment reimbursements were made with which businesses. So um, if, you, if you want that level of detail by project area. Page 83 of the MRB. Starting page 83 of the budget. Thanks. Yep. Uh-huh. Of the, of the mayor's recommended budget. I need to get <laughs> Sorry. Yes, we have 70 more slides to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good time to get a snack. No, uh, <laughs> yes, we can absolutely break that out uh, either between our annual budget or uh, provide information on that as it relates. Thank you. Okay, next slide, please. And then next slide. So discretionary expenses, you see this in the general fund uh, department budgets. They're called insights. Uh, for us, they relate a little bit more to specific programs and projects. Um, you see the header for programs. Again, this is a preview for how we're starting to separate um, allocations within Workday. Uh, we'll have appropriations for programs, and then within those programs, we'll either have funding that go into them on a holding account basis, or we'll have requests that go into specific projects. So that's what you're seeing in these slides is that breakdown between programs and projects. Um, starting with arts and culture, uh, key changes in our budget and new requests uh, relate to 25000 for additional funds to do activation and programming in McCarthy Plaza and Regent Street, working in coordination with the county on some of the programs and activities they're doing and being able to provide some funds to continue that effort. And then the 150000 for essentially a public art program. This would be within the Nine Line project area. These funds could be used in conjunction with the mayor's goal for a west side art installation uh, if it falls within the Nine Line project area. If not, it would be for an additional art commission. Next slide, please. Looking at Gallivan related programs, you see uh, 214000 in uh, maintenance and repairs. This is appropriation of funds for increased maintenance for the agency owned retail spaces uh, along Gallivan Avenue that are aging and starting to need additional funding. And then just over 500000 in Gallivan Plaza planning. This is an appropriation of reserve funds moving forward to look at doing uh, design enhancements and capital repairs as they are recommended in what is the design strategy that we're currently undertaking. Next slide. And again, please interrupt me if I'm, I'm going through these quickly, so don't hesitate. Uh, you see a major part of our budget this year is our commercial assistance programs. This is an update to our existing revolving loan fund as well as our existing adaptive reuse loan program. Updating them, uh, f similar to how we've done our housing loan programs, bringing back to the board updated policy and, and use of those funds and expanding those, especially the adaptive reuse across project areas. And then also you'll re recall from our presentation, we're looking at the creation of a storefront activation program and providing funding for that. And then potentially uh, the cultural and community component that um, will come back to you. So uh, in anticipation of that coming to the board, you'll see a significant amount of our budget this year spread across multiple project areas uh, to start providing funds in order to roll that out as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Under strategic intervention, you recall as a board, you have set aside funds in different project areas for this. This is really to look at uh, appropriating funds in a holding account for project area development with uh, certain uses, but uh, it would be a return to the board when we have specific projects or acquisition or site development costs. Next slide, please. Looking at some of the infrastructure improvements and requests, uh, the first is 50,000 for the City Creek daylighting project. That is currently going through a design plan uh, to daylight a portion of City Creek along Folsom Trail. This would be looking to take those design plans to a level of construction drawings and ultimately hopefully uh, start working on that project. 
and then 550,000 for the demolition of the Sugar House DI building uh, and fire station property there in anticipation of offering that property for affordable housing development. Next slide, please. And then additional infrastructure improvements, 3.6 million in the depot district in anticipation of the station center project. Uh, you recall that you as a board allocated funds for consultant. Uh, that study is underway right now and this is starting to look at uh, continuing to appropriate funds for utility upgrades, street improvements, construction, streetscape, parks, et cetera, uh, as part of that overall project. Then 100,000 within North Temple to help with uh, utility upgrades for projects or street improvements or additional streetscape projects in that project area. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Danny, on the depot district and the uh, station center, uh, are we going to have a briefing on the exact scope of that 3.6 in the project at some later date? That money will need to come back to the board for any use. So that, that'll be set aside with the additional funds right now. And those projects will come back to the board. And then as it relates to the specific plan we're doing right now, you should be getting that briefing, I think, either July or August with the, the outcome of that study. Okay, okay. Mr. Chair? Go ahead. For, so for um, similar questions, so same areas. So with the HTRC, if we were to get it, mm -hmm. we would get access to some funding to do housing, obviously, mm -hmm. because that's the first thing, but also for infrastructure. Yes. In that area. So we could potentially leverage this money with that or just use that one and not use this? Yes, you could potentially uh, use HRZ for some of these purposes and then have these funds available for, for providing other benefits or parts of the project, okay. et cetera. Thanks. Where, where does this 3.68 come from? Again? This is uh, Depot District Tax Increment. Depot District Tax Increment. And we're saying to leave it in Depot District, but... but in this budget we're specifying that it would be used for infrastructure yes related to station center and the development of our property there okay. and it would be added to funds that have been previously allocated for that purpose so the board has allocated some depot district tax increment dollars over the years into that account um the total is the total amount uh is about eight million uh, just over eight million with this additional three point six. if the board approves this additional 3.6 um, it's not quite enough to fund the previous estimate uh, cost for the infrastructure improvements, and so the board would have to discuss sort of how to make up that gap or whether to rescope the project. And when we say infrastructure improvements, we're talking about the upgraded streets with the planters and things like the festival. Combination streets. of upgrading the actual utilities servicing Underneath the project and, and then the also the streetscape system. that okay. you've seen previously. Yes. Thank you. Board Member Dugan. And on the same front, both of these two funds, if they're we could also use some of these for affordable housing in other districts because it, on the affordable housing side or is it all specifically has to go in the depot district? You could uh, transfer these funds out of the depot district project area if you're using it for affordable housing, yes. Okay. Yes. Right. And the depot district is transferring some money to the affordable housing programs. Um, Let's see. It has both. The depot district Sorry, is, Jen. yeah, is, is transferring about a million dollars to the primary housing fund. And then, That's worth a second. oh, a million, yeah, a million yeah. dollars to the secondary housing fund. So just over two million from the depot district is going to housing. Okay, so that just begs the next question. Sorry, Mr. Chair, about who, how do we determine and, and how much do we determine the, each district uh, provides funding to that primary and secondary housing fund? The, the primary housing fund is what receives all of the statutory obligations from all the project areas. So depot has a 10% requirement similar to other project areas. So that gets all gathered, put in the primary housing fund. The secondary housing fund is additional funds that you take also from project areas and then put towards affordable housing. State statute separates those two different sections different requirements for reporting, but both can go towards affordable housing with slightly different nuances. And so uh, as, as Jen and I described it in her memo, think of primary housing of what you must do, and that gets gathered, and then secondary housing is what you like to do above and beyond that. So, And I would say that there's no, um, there's no uh, prohibition, sorry, there's no prohibition against the board making a decision to spend 100% of the increment on affordable housing. It's just what other, you know, absent your tax increment obligations, obviously. So, you know, if you've agreed to repay tax increment to a business, you'd have to do that. But you could choose to spend all of the tax increment on housing if you wanted to. Right. But 10% off the top is 
automatically going to the primary. Required by law. Mm -hmm. Required by law for all the districts. Okay, that's perfect. And and it, it depend on it depends on what the law said when the district was created. So you'll notice that some districts have one amount, another other districts have other amounts. Some districts have no requirement, um, even though our city tends to require it anyway. And I. I'm going to ask another question, if it's okay, Mr. Chair, Yes. on that. So the primary housing fund and secondary housing fund are from all the taxing, all the areas, and they can be used anywhere in the city. But we do, the only one that's geographically restricted is the Westside Community Initiative, and that's based on our decision to geographically limit it to the west side. Is that correct? That's correct. And that can be housing. It can be other things. The Westside Community Initiative is not part of that. So, well, so because it, it is funded from the tax increment from the Port Authority for affordable housing, I think we oh. need to be careful about ancillary uses of that money, um, of that tax increment stream. I think that does That's not mean right. okay. that you couldn't uh, enhance the West Side Community Initiative with funding sources other than the tax increment stream from the port. Does that make sense? So, like, it if you sense, wanted yes. to transfer money from the pro uh, program income fund, port into legislation the says that it must be used for housing. We have said that we want it to be used on the west side. On the west side for equity sharing models, equity sharing which models might include some commercial. And okay, I'm following now. Thank you. It, the only two things I would add to that is, I, Jen, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the original statute for the inland port was to go towards affordable housing for the areas affected by the inland port. So I think the general consensus was it would be somewhat near there. It wouldn't be you right. know, across the city. So that's kind of where you as a board came with where to define that west side. Um, and then the other part is within the west side community initiative, it does provide and speak to the ability to do commercial and, and affordable, but I think that was always intended to be if you did a mixed use structure that still also had a residential component. Tell me if I got I any of that wrong. That. And okay. I guess actually my original question that I, I lost myself on was that's the only point for our, any of our affordable housing activities, that's the only one of our funds that is geographically limited. Is that true? Or do any of the other project areas have specific housing things within the project area? No, that's the only one that I think everything else I goes to the clearing house. The one well, the one I think is the ADU initiative in the nine line oh, would yeah. be restricted to the nine line area. So I think that if you were to create a, a program within a project area with project area funds, you might be tying your hands geographically. So I think that ADU program is tied geographically and that probably has as much to do with the county's expectations as yes. the board's decision. Um, that one's actually, yeah, Jen, you're right. That was a requirement to have one in the nine line area, but the funding that you allocate can also go to ADUs citywide. We are just obligated to have one it must be done in, in nine line. line area, and so that's where we've chosen to start the pilot program. So we meet that requirement Excellent. and then take that show citywide if we want. Thank you. I know you've, I've been told this like a thousand times, but <laughs> thank you for recapping. Okay. No, thank you. Any other questions before? Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, it, last infrastructure uh, program is 300000 for ballpark planning. This is essentially to appropriate funds to engage a consultant to help with a vision and implementation plan for the offering and development of the stadium and adjacent properties. Next slide, please. This is what all of those programs and allocations look like across the multiple project areas. So this is kind of good to see how they fall within the project area budget specifically, and then how they fall between the program and the projects uh, on the right. You'll see that there are some allocations um, and programs like the commercial assistance program and strategic intervention that they have allocations across multiple funds. Yeah, I, mean, um, I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, sorry, I should have mentioned it. Um, the if we go a slide back on the ballpark um the, the results of the competition were released very recently uh on the ballpark next next uh the sign competition that mm -hmm. the, the, the administration and the mayor uh been pushing and i was reading through those and it was very exciting to see some of those dreams and uh, that some of the the community members submitted um so how is that connect with this? I mean, that competition is ongo ongoing right now, mm -hmm. and it has a price tag, or, you know, for a price um, for whomever wins it. I think it's like 25,000. Um, and how is that, 
isn't that going to happen first and how for us to go next about planning that, uh, who, whomever wins? How, do, do you know about the process yep. on this? Uh, it's a great question, and I appreciate you bringing that up. Yes, the, the voting went live at 12.01 this morning, so that those have been released and the voting has started. The idea of hiring this consultant would be to help us as both an agency and a city to balance the work that was done as part of the station area plan, and then now with the design competition, a lot of the themes and ideas are coming out of that. There is a significant amount of work done by the community and with the consultants of what the ballpark neighborhood could be as part of that station area plan, but it didn't address the ballpark specifically because the idea at the time was that the team wasn't leaving, the ballpark was gonna be there. And now with the design competition, as you said, we're getting a lot of ideas, we're getting a lot of themes of what the community is, is proposing for that. And so this would kind of bridge those two efforts and then help us kind of pull out what we feel are the highest priorities and desired outcomes of what we want to see there. And then that would inform us of when we put the property out on the street for development. So it's taking that, all of these ideas, and then now kind of sorting through them, coming up with the priority and then putting that out as what are our main things that we want to accomplish in redevelopment of that property. Okay. Thank you. Does that answer the question better? Yes, <laughs> it did. Thank you. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, so back to this, you'll see that with commercial assistance programs and strategic intervention, these are specific allocations across the different project areas. Housing we can do anywhere, but the tax increment we receive from the project areas, specifically to any commercial efforts, has to stay within those project areas. That's why you see multiple allocations for what those programs will be and how they'll be spent within those areas. Next slide, please. Okay, now focusing on our housing activities. Uh, this is part of your annual housing funding strategy. First thing I need to mention is that first dollar amount should be one million and not two million. We, we had some overlap in requests and working through the final pieces of our budget. So one million would go to property acquisition and this is just as, as you know as a board, setting aside funds regularly for acquisition opportunities as they come up and looking at turning those into affordable housing projects. Uh, Director Mono, your comment on the ADU starting with the pilot program in the nine line, but allocating 1.4 million for that, um, and then potentially over time being able to take that project or program in other areas of the city. Next slide, please. Mr. Mr. Chair. Uh, board member Dugan first, <laughs> okay. and then uh, yeah, <laughs> and I, I'm Can we go back a slide, please? Sorry. This, the housing side of the house. So uh, we have our four priorities, mm -hmm. right? The wealth building, family housing, deeply, and missing middle. Uh, and we have had a uh, uh, request that did not meet, meet our priorities. And... Uh, have we or have it always met has there always been a project that met the priorities so this last NOFA that we did last year that you approved the allocations for back in December I believe that was probably the first NOFA where we really took not just your priorities we've done priorities before but that's where we took some of those priorities and put them in as thresholds and and you recall when we did that presentation yeah that we were really surprised and fortunate that we had so many projects that not only hit the priorities, but actually met those threshold designations. So to answer your question, technically the answer would be no, but we've really only kind of added that extra layer one time. So I think as we continue to do this, that may happen. And, and we'll discuss at that time of how we either present that to you as a board as it relates to those specific requests and projects, or if you then want to either reissue the NOFA, change the parameters of it, or just then put it out on an ongoing basis. Because mm -hmm. you remember when we first put it out, it's competitive. Right, right. And everyone knows what those are, our priorities are. They're not secret, so they know where we want to go. So I guess that just, uh, okay, that helps me. Because I, I was just worried that, hey, we, we come to a point where no one, no one makes the cut. So what do we do next? So I guess we'll have to come to that bridge when we see it. We, we technically have that right now related to our high opportunity funds that we've put out in every NOFA, mm -hmm. and we've had one project make the cut, and then you as a board uh, have been uh, approving along with the mayor's recommendation to just hold on to those funds and continue to leave them out there on an ongoing basis. You recall we've had some projects we've tried to put them in. Those haven't happened, so we just continue to work on trying to hit that goal with those funds. All right. Thanks. 
Um, on the property acquisition, I know you said it's one million instead of two million. We're just sort of brainstorming. Can can property acquisition, if it's intended for housing, happen outside of project areas, even with project area funds? Yes. And we just have to remember that we purchased that with the intent to do affordable housing, and we have to actually do affordable housing on it. Otherwise, we'd be out of compliance with. Absolutely. Okay. But we've never done that yet. Oh yeah, that's the second question. Um, or have we? Was the overnight? I don't think we've think bought. No, that was in North Temple. Was it in North Temple? Okay. I don't Trying think we've think. bought property yet. Uh, outside of a project area. If you remember, we were looking at a property on Foothill for a while. That was yeah. one that we were coming to saying, this is kind of our first attempt at going outside of a project area. Yeah, that's right, because the firehouse was technically in yeah. the project area. At the time. Yeah, yeah that's, okay. They were the DI. Yeah, you, yeah okay, you know thanks. why I was hesitant. It's been discussed. <laughs> but yes, apparently <laughs> not happened. <laughs> Have we done the funding thing outside of the a CRA? Yes, because um, the high opportunity area was outside of a CRA, and I oh, think okay. that, um, or sorry, the Richmond Flats. Um, and did we take it from one CRA, or did we take a little bit from all a bunch of other CRAs? Uh, if I remember, I believe the allocation of high opportunity funds was part of that twenty-one million that very first, reallocation. Yeah, Is that right. Which gathered up funds from a lot of places. Yeah, it was multiple project areas. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I just got a text from Kara Lindsley. We did do a property acquisition for Ninth East Lofts. This was the Housing Authority project uh, on Ninth East, just south of Fourth South, where we did buy the property. Hmm. Yeah. Yep. See, it thank takes you, a, thank it you, takes you, Kara. A village. Thank you, Kara. <laughs> <laughs> and you thought you weren't needed in this meeting. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> any other questions? All right. Next slide, please. Um, continuing with the housing activities, uh, looking at putting just over four and a half million in the housing development loan program. This is the competitive NOFA that we will uh, be issuing for this year. And then we have an allocation of 380,000 for family and workforce housing. This is a function of our interlocal agreements with the school district for Nine Line and State Street. They have asked us to take a portion of their tax increment as it relates to housing and put it towards family and workforce housing to support the school district, teachers, et cetera. So this is something that will be included in that competitive NOFA, and then it'll be on us to make sure that any projects we do that meet that guideline, these funds are placed into that. But really this is more just a monitoring and reporting uh, requirement that we have. But Thanks, Danny, Mr. Chair. Uh, but what, what kind of things can we fund with $380,000? It, it'll be leveraged with the other four and a half million. Okay. Um, but it, as you stated, one of your priorities is family housing. So we anticipate getting projects that'll need way more than just this 380. We just have to report to the school district that this section of money actually went into those projects and can be added to other funding sources. And, but also add that we also have $4 million as well destined to similar uses so yes. they know yep. it's more than So you as a board are putting a lot more than just 380000 towards family and workforce. We just have to specifically report this. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sorry. Probably should have started with that uh, description. That, no, that, that's okay. I just <laughs> want to make sure the, the school district knows. I know, um, you know, how it was a little bit difficult to exactly. get this one passed. So, Thank um, you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Next slide, please. And then uh, new this year as part of one of your priorities, uh, two point million towards shared equity. This is appropriation of funds, likely will go out initially in ANOFA, but this is to address shared equity and wealth building priority for the West Side Community Initiative. So this NOFA will provide those funds uh, anticipated to be in the form of either loans or equity investments to either specific projects or programs that entities propose to us. So you will see that as a board of if people are starting to put these programs together outside of you know what some of the considerations you have right now, we know there are multiple groups looking at options. So we wanted to put this funding out there to see where some of those are at and start prioritizing this as it relates to projects uh, specifically within the West Side Community Initiative. Next slide, please. And then, Director Dugan, you, you kind of stole my thunder for this slide, but this is just a recap of where you're at with how this all fits within the annual housing funding strategy. So, you know, we come to the board with what the specific allocations are uh, for each of the funds that are projected. You as a board recently approved those four priorities uh, in the middle, and then now as part of the budget, 
you're allocating those funds to the specific activities that we have uh, recommended within the budget. So that's how it all kind of comes together. Next slide, please. And then here's what those allocations look across the four uh, housing funds. And then uh, the column on the left is what those look like with the specific programs. Uh, that's pretty much the same information you see at the bottom with the total by all program funds, but you'll notice that uh, the nine line, because that is a allocation of tax increment primarily, that is where the ADU money is coming from and will be spent. And then next slide, please. I think we're transitioning over to admin, so one more slide, please. The only significant change in our administrative budget is uh, an increase of 276000 for our overall admin costs and also the addition of two project coordinator positions to help with workload uh, and start providing some of uh, entry-level positions for our staff document. Danny, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm in a delay today. That's okay. Where would I you mean, like to I go back to? I was at the airport at 5 in the morning today, so <laughs> I'm just, uh, I, um, so it, it, on the ADU, uh, can we go back two slides, please? Thank you. Um, is there any uh, the timeline on when those uh, uh, funds will be available for the public? What is the process? And are we partnering with uh, a, a community organization, or are we starting the process to, to do that, to uh, distribute those funds? Um, so from a requirement standpoint, I think it's the first five years of the Nine Line Project area, we need to have a program up and running. And so we're going to probably be able to meet that. We're in a position right now to put out an RFP uh, with the intention of partnering with other organizations to help us really hone in on what the creation and administration of that program would be. And that could be a combination of working directly with them or them providing advice to us of how we could craft that program and maintain it internally. Um, and then I think in light of Director Mono's comments recently, we are going to be bringing that back for a discussion just to update and answer some of the questions I think you had of how that program may look uh, both within Nine Line and address I think some of those larger discussions you've had as a council. So we're setting that for your June agenda and then any input or feedback we get from that we can roll right into then putting that RFP on the street working with procurement in that process right now. I, I, I tell you I'm, I'm hearing a lot from my, some of my neighbors. The, you know, the, the ADU discussion that we had earlier this year, and there's still people talking about ADUs, and um, we, you know, there was some sort of urgency uh, about us uh, to, to, to make that, put those funds. So, yeah, I, I would love to, as soon as we can make that process go faster, that would be great. I don't know Can't spend this sense. money till July 1 either way, so <laughs> we'll come close to that. I appreciate it. <laughs> Board member. Going along Board that, member. I think there is a sense of urgency um, because we did put a time limit like we agreed on. You know, we want to see if it works or not, and then if it works, great. If it doesn't, we have to make adjustments and then look at the owner occupancy requirement that we were um, discussing. Um, so if, because you're adding more people, or just two people, but <laughs> like a, a legion, just two people, um, and if, you know, if the council um, agreed in this budget season for, as a council to add that million dollars that was in our legislative intent, mm -hmm. so basically if the, if the mayor decided that the best place for that million dollars for ADUs would be with the RDA for you guys to manage, do you think you can do it? Yeah. And then you'll have $2.4 million. And I assume that million make would be citywide. City yes. Right, to Thank make you. it citywide. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. That's a million that we... I'm not looking back at my staff right now. I don't yeah, just to clarify, that million is not in the budget right now. Correct. But it's the council the could budget, add it. But we wanted... The council could transfer it to RDA. Right. Meaning there's no prohibition against transferring general fund dollars to RDA. In fact, that's what we do with the housing NOFA dollars. Okay. Great. I only see smiles behind you. So. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> uh, next slide or two slides. I think that's our last. It was the admin. Mr. Uh, Chair? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to have a question. Uh, it's a small item, but back at the beginning of the discretionary items, there was the $150,000 for RDA Arts and Culture Program. Um, that is, is that $150,000 an additional allocation on top of the 1.5% for art? Yes, that is a function of uh, within our art policy, we have 
The, well, the city has a one and a half percent for it. That's totally separate from us. Yes. Within our, our policy, we have that. Uh, if we do infrastructure projects, we will meet that. And then we also have the provision that we can um, either incentivize developers to incorporate it within their projects, or w you as a board can also budget additional public art funds at any time from project areas for projects like this. And this is additional. This would so be that this additional isn't part. Taking away all the one and a half percent or Correct. anything else. Okay. Yep. Um, and that okay so i i would love to find out what how that process will be in terms of i, I mean is that going to be a transfer out to the arts council or what's so that? as per our policy we start with working with the arts council to see if between their workload and what they're targeting if we can just provide funding and work directly with them to put out an art commission through them and and use their process uh, and if either they can't do that, or if we have a specific project or uh, commission in mind, then we have also done that ourselves internally with like the Granary Art Mural Program and Art for Hope. So we have the option to do either one, but we generally start with seeing if we can use the partners who do this uh, as part of their jobs without imposing on them a burden. So we okay. have that ability to go either way. There's a, an additional $150,000 that you'll see in CIP on the general fund side for new West Side art. So there's $150,000 in CIP, which is separate from the $150,000 that we just talked about in the nine line context. They may or they may could not be combined. They could be combined if it's in the nine line project area, or they could be two separate areas on the West Side. I'm excited for that. I think that we need a statement piece on the west side and love for it to be. So if the councilor, sorry, if the council or the board felt it important for those items to be combined on, in terms of the policy direction of one larger piece versus two less large pieces maybe, um, might be good for the council to consider from a policy perspective because we could add that language into the budget to specify that those, that the expectation is that those funds are combined. I see, okay. Um, Okay, great. Mr. Uh, Chair. Yes, go ahead. Uh, on the administrative costs, we have uh, project areas that start to expire. Yes. And of course, sometimes the bigger project areas are expiring and the administrative budget kind of stays relatively flat, was slightly growing just because there's always administrative costs are gonna go up. So the, I have to believe you have a, a fairly good strategy on when these uh, project areas are, are uh, re expiring, declining, retiring, uh, how we account for and how we supply the administrative costs going forward in the future. I think, I think Jen described this very well in her memo. We have, um, we have a conversation that needs to start happening because as these project areas expire, even some of the newer ones we are approving, while they may be matching them in tax increment, a lot of the newer project areas, and especially the HCRZs, have a much lower threshold for what we can contribute towards admin costs. So our workload may not be going down, but we need to start looking at other sources of how to cover our admin expenses. And so we, we are already starting to have those conversations internally you know, with finance, and we appreciate Jen and Ben work at recognizing that as well because that's something I think we're going to need to look even just beyond the agency for how we cover those expenses. Okay, great. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Danny, I have a quick question and it's uh, stated on the uh, policy questions and it's number two. Uh, it relates to a station center area mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's about the public and private partnership models uh, about for governance uh, for, for funds. Um, obviously, I have uh, you know some opinions about this, and I would like to uh, pick your brain about this and bring it up uh, to the board. Uh, you know, this last uh, this year, it feels like a year ago, but this year, uh, talking to the legislature about the Fair Park Authority and how the conflicts we have with that, uh, and stating our issues with our model and also with the Inland Port Authority and creating these uh, uh, unelected uh, boards uh, that decide how public funds are, are, are used, are utilized, is something that I struggle with. Uh, so I would like to pick your brain a little more and see maybe you can elaborate. <laughs> Uh, I can tell you for certain we're not necessarily looking at becoming the next inland port, but I think uh, Jen did a great job of putting this in the context of Station Center because that is 
a conversation that has come up as we've looked at the development of that uh, initially with uh, potentially looking at the U being a partner and what level that is a true innovation district to where we're at right now. And where we're at right now is that is what is uh, a big part of our conversations with the consultant of not just what the recommendations are for developing the property, but as the agency is looking at becoming or continuing to be the long-term owner of the property and looking at ground leasing, and then the, the uses we're targeting for how we want to activate that and have some level of technology or innovation district, we recognize that there probably needs to be some form of an ongoing governance structure. And that could range everywhere from looking like a simple owner's association to something being more of what really governs the uses and the tenants and the activation and the programming. Um, so we're, we're trying to understand how that fits within what our goals are for developing it and what we see as uh, what the ultimate users and tenants would be and then how we make sure that we do that not just as part of that initial development offering and scenario, but how we make sure that we're accomplishing those goals within that area in perpetuity. And that's, like I said, everything from do you have some kind of organization that helps with the program and activation or what is our role in terms of what may be a larger board and governance structure and how does that look? So it's a great question and it's one that we're looking at and we'd love to have any feedback or input from the board of whether we should be looking at that even beyond Station Center and what that could be not just on other properties, project areas, but citywide for, for tools that we want to use. Well, let me, I, I, I think that this is, is, is good to uh, explore. Uh, it's always good to like see how models work, especially in an area like the station center. I do struggle uh, going on that path, especially because um, I, I feel like it undermines um, the stances that this city has taken with the legislature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, by cre by the legislature creating these uh, governance boards that right. use public uh, monies from the city, but they are unelected, and the accountability uh, is an issue there, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Uh, and if we were to create a, a similar uh, entity uh, ourselves, then we have less of a stance to argue these other issues sure. with the state. Uh, uh, Fair Park, Inland Port, and you know the state will love to probably create these unelected groups. Uh, and we have yeah. discussed quite a bit this year about these other uh, mechanisms that the state is trying to create, uh, pit slits and whatever <laughs> else. Um, uh, so I, I usually struggle with the idea. I do understand that we want to create some sort of continuity and, mm. and vision long term. Um, but I do uh, uh, prefer that you know an elected body holds the the reins uh, on this. Yeah. So um, so yeah, I just wanted to leave that out there. I appreciate that context, and and I know as um, a little flipping with my initial remark of saying we're not looking to be the inland port, but I think that's very relevant because as we look at it, we're seeing it as our role of how do we expand upon what opportunity we would have as the long-term landowner of continuing to be able to provide the public benefits we want. So while we talk about what a governance structure could be, um, that is to what extent we may need to be pulling in other experts or other providers that would still be within that. So they would be stakeholders, they would be people who are involved in that and helping inform what that might be from even just a programming and activation standpoint. And then the benefit of the structure as far as the RDA is concerned is how can we structure that in a way with a ground lease or other development agreements so that we can continue to even just apply some of the funding or revenue we get to continuing to provide the public benefits and whether that's you know providing space for small businesses whether that's subsidizing that whether that's you know part of the program activation that's the level of how we're looking at it not necessarily something that I think would be at the level of what the state's setting up in those but I think you're absolutely right that we have to make sure that we're doing that within that right context and uh, yeah and not uh, providing that problem yeah you just don't want to create that 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 is very important to me that we're not going that route um, um, at least mm -hmm. I'm talking about me personally, that route is, is not the route that I will prefer to go at all. Sure. Um, and, and, and it opens up uh, for a lot of issues uh, in, in our relationship with the state, but also I don't think necessarily is the, uh, the approach that this city needs to go to. Any other? Yes, sorry. Um, no, that's fine. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to also state that I share all those same concerns and I 
like want to say before we even get too far into that that uh, or too far down the road that I feel very strongly that we not um, um, put ourselves in that position. So I just want to echo that yeah. support for myself. Thank you. I you know I I know that you. Uh, you have the, mo the some of the most brilliant people I ever uh, interacted <laughs> with, and we can Thank find you. a different path uh, to to accomplish similar goals, but creating a uh, in an accountable, unelected group of people to uh, direct public funds. Um, I yes. just want to leave that out there. Any other comments? Sorry, no. No, that's <laughs> I, I honestly appreciate that feedback because those are conversations we're having right now, and I think that's very helpful to make sure we limit and. Yes. Thank you. Stay focused. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Chair, just go ahead. And maybe a, a, a later date, talk about the uh, bonding ideas on the uh, some catalytic projects mm -hmm. and stuff like that, maybe at a separate date in July or? Yeah, it's been a while since we looked at that, so it might be, mm -hmm. yeah. might be worth looking at that, especially now with some of these project areas coming online. Yeah. Please put it on your to-do list. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions, information we can provide? Is that the last slide? Uh -huh. uh, that's all of our slides. Uh, I'll, I'll just note that we, we had a, an appendix section too as part of the presentation. So if anyone really wants to go on a deep dive, um, uh, feel free to do that. And if you have any questions as part of that, let us know. Thank you. I think I'm supposed to turn it over to you for. <laughs> I, think you, I think you covered everything, especially with the council member questions throughout. So I didn't have anything additional to add other than um, maybe just a general uh, request for feedback from board members if there are elements of the RDA budget that you want to see um, either adjusted or um, discussed further. Um, let us know. We'll let the RDA staff know so that um, we can figure out when it makes sense to talk about in public again. Um, every now and then, especially if things are going back and forth between the general fund and RDA, we, we try as much as we can to schedule an RDA meeting, but every now and then we will talk about an RDA issue if it's also related to the general fund. So general fund unresolved issues um, is also another time to talk about RDA follow-up, but um, staff will be tracking those issues as we keep talking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Moving along on the agenda, um, we, uh, we did good on time. Uh, we're moving to item number four, report of an announcement from the executive director. I don't know if uh, Rachel, anybody? No, no updates. Thank you. Um, reports on announcement from the RDA staff. Danny? I, I think we did enough last week. I probably should have split those between the two meetings. So <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> This microphone, so you can go whenever. Uh, thank you, uh, Danny. I, there is no uh, items on reading briefings consent, uh, and there is not a closed session. So I think we uh, are adjourned as the RDA board. Mr. Chair, can we come back at 3.25, 15 minutes? Let's do it. Okay, thank you. Does that work for you, Cindy Lou? Okay.